Let's talk about repentance. Repent is a beautiful word. In biblical Greek, it's metanoia, to change your mind. In biblical Hebrew, it's shub, to turn around. So repentance is a change of thinking which leads to a change of direction. Jesus said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Can you see how faith and repentance go hand in hand? When we believe the gospel, we repent. Our minds change, our behaviors change, and our lives change. Through repentance, the Holy Spirit is making us more and more like Jesus day by day. Until we see our Savior face to face, we must keep moving forward. So today, as we worship in the Word, repent and believe in the Gospel. Amen. Welcome. <laughs> I had no idea how this was going to happen when I said amen. All right. Well, uh, last week to this week hasn't gotten a lot better. As a matter of fact, it got a little worse. Uh, so bear with me as I uh, get through this. Pray for my voice to get through. Um, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. And we are back in the book of Luke. Very excited about it. Enjoyed this summer, the summer in the Psalms. If you missed any of those sermons, please go online and look at those. Uh, just fantastic uh, way of unpacking some very familiar Psalms and looking at them in a different way. Before we jump into the scripture, I just want to um, uh, also reiterate the fact that we're um, collecting school supplies. Uh, if you can't drop them off here, Anytime Fitness, uh, Tim and Laurie over there in Anytime Fitness have opened up their place so you can drop it off, well, anytime. And so you can take it over there. And um, we're just very blessed to be able to do this, to take care of the schools and to make sure that they are all supplied with what they need. Um, you know, we there's so much anxiety and everything going around with getting ready for school. We want to make sure that if there's anything we can do to ease that, we're going to do that as well. And so when Audra and Pastor Marty go to these schools, we're going to give them these school supplies, but also we're going to give them the knowledge that they can come to Live Oak Church if there's anything they need, that they can come to us if there's material needs, if there's prayer needs, if there's whatever, that they can come to us. And so we're very excited to partner with our community in that way. Uh, also, we are going back to our uh, two-service model on August 15th. That means we're adding the 9 o'clock service. Um, last week, you know, we, <laughs> I guess it just got too hot. Y'all saw 115 degrees. Some of y'all are watching online and said 115, nah, that ain't happening. And so, um, but anyway, August 15th, we're going to go back to those two services and uh, so that we can make room so we have plenty of room for people to come and to hear the gospel. Now, what that means for you is as many of you who are willing to say, okay, I will go to the 9 o'clock service. Uh, most people, most first-time guests, most people who are checking out the church will go to that that time that they're used to going, you know, that, that, that typical time. And so they'll typically come to the 1030 service. And so if we can make sure that we have room for that. So if you're willing to come to the 9 o'clock service, um, and also if you're willing to come to the 9 o'clock service so that you can serve in the 1030 service. You know, that way you're not missing church. You can come to the 9 o'clock service and then help Jordan out uh, in the nursery and or in the um, uh, kids' church. It would be fantastic. So a uh, lot going on. Uh, please, please, please sign up for our newsletter. Uh, we, August, let me tell you, we have something every Sunday in August. Every week we have something going on. Uh, we're not usually that busy, but it's all good stuff. Uh, if you are here and you have never, uh, you haven't joined yet, you haven't become a member yet, uh, our next Discover membership class is August the 8th, okay? Uh, and you can, you know, fill that, hey, I want to do that, put that on that blue card, take it to the information table. Um, it's a short class, about two hours long, and we talk through who we are, why we do what we do, um, and, and just kind of the nuts and bolts of Live Oak Church. We don't believe in you just coming, shaking my hand, saying I want to be a member, and then you find out 
something about who we are, and you're like, wait a minute, I don't, I don't like that. Well, then you shouldn't have joined. You know, so uh, we want people to come and be informed, and at the end of that class, you can say, yes, I'm in. I want to be part of the vision. I want to be part of the mission. Uh, or, nah, I, I need some more time. So anyway, that's coming up on August the 8th. All right, enough of that junk. Let's get into Scripture. Matthew, uh, not Matthew, uh, Luke chapter 13, starting with verse 1. There was some present at that time, that very time, who told about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And he answered them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans? Because they suffered in this way. No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Or those 18 on whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them, do you think that they were worse offenders than the others who lived in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And he told this parable, a man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came seeking fruit on it and found none. And he said to the fine dresser, Look, for three years now I have come seeking fruit for on this tree, and I found none. Cut it down. Why should use up the ground? And he answered him and said, Sir, let it alone for this year also, until I dig around it and put on manure. And then if it should bear fruit next year, well and good. But if not, then you can cut it down. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for this opportunity we have to come together right now. And I pray for those in this room and for those online watching, God, that your Holy Spirit would just be full, fill, would fill this place, that it would speak to every one of us. I pray, God, as I preach your word, strengthen my voice for this next 20 minutes, God. I pray that you would allow me to be obedient to the context and the teaching of the word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So let's uh, unpack this a little bit, then we're going to apply it, and I know it's a little warm, and, so, and I don't have much of a voice, so I'm going to rock and roll through this thing, so keep up, and we're going um, uh, to hopefully finish this thing pretty quick. All right, we have three things here. Uh, we have the question, we have the answer, and then we have the reason. So uh, verses 1 and 2, there's a question. There's some people present at that very time. And there were Galileans whose blood Pilate mingled with their sacrifices. Now you read that and you're like, okay, that's weird. And it is. And I'll be honest with you, we don't exactly know what in the world that means. I've read commentaries and most, what most people believe is that whatever, uh, what, what possibly happened, what more than likely happened, is that there was an insurrection. There was always these people, these Jewish people that were trying to rise up because they didn't like the oppressive nature of the Roman government. And so these guys, there was an insurrection, or, uh, and these people rose up, and Pilate, the Roman governor, sent like a brute squad to go in and kill the uprising, and the blood of the people mixed with the blood of the animal sacrifice, okay? And so that's kind of what we feel like what's going on. But if you imagine that the idea of the Jewish ceremonies and the Jewish sense of sacrifice and, and, and what that entailed, that, that was very no-no. That, was, that, was, that would have been seen as just a, a total affront, an abomination. And so that's what, uh, what, that's what Jesus is talking about there. Uh, so the question Jesus then asked, he said, do you think that... Um, these Galileans were worse sinners than the other Galileans because they suffered in this way. The question is, do you think because a specific group that they were, um, do you think, yeah, do you think because this happened to that specific group because they were worse sinners than the rest? And, and this is um, a common Hebrew teaching that the greater the sin, the greater the punishment. Good things happen to good people and bad things happen to bad people. We could go on and we could unpack this. This is, this is evident in the book of Job. You know, all this stuff is happening to Job and his friends, quote unquote friends, are like, listen, obviously God is mad at you. Just kill yourself and get it over with. I mean, talk about friends, right? I mean, that, and so this was prevalent in the Old Testament theology that obviously God will bless those who are doing good. And if you're doing bad, God is going to curse you. And that seems kind of what we, you know, we hear people who don't have a very fleshed out 
um, gospel theology today, and we still believe that. And we'll use words like karma. We'll use words like, oh, you know, good things come to those who do good. And, you know, that's not always the case. And you can look at life all around you, and you see where, you know, bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. And, and this happens all the time. And so what Jesus is saying, he's asking this question. He's like, do you think that this happened? Because they were worse sinners. These, these particular Galileans, do you think that they were worse than the rest of the Galileans that are killed or that, that die? And so that's the question that we have to ask. And that's the question that is posed to us. That's the question that we really today here, 2,000 some odd years later, have to ask ourselves is like, okay, God, how is this idea of sin? And we've talked about this before, but... This idea of sin, is my sin better than your sin? If my sin is better than your sin, then I'm better than you are. And so I am higher, I'm, I'm higher in this whole Christian thing than you. You know, because I, we're all sinners. We're all sorry sap suckers in need of grace. But my sin is tolerable. You know, maybe I sin by, maybe I lie or I gossip. Yeah, but you're addicted to this or you're addicted to that. Or, you know, your sins are more horrible than mine. And so God is going to bless me more than you. And I get to be higher on the, you know, the Christian arrogant scale than you are. And so that's kind of what we... You know, we see this even today in our churches. You know, we classify different sins. We classify the sins that we don't like, the icky sins, and we classify the sins that are okay, the sins over here. And then there's another level of, pe of things that aren't even sinful that we've made sinful, and you're like, well, you're not even dealing with your real sin. You're inventing this sin and making it a sin. And so, anyway, that's what's going on there. So that's the question that jo Jesus po poses uh, I mean, the, the, you know, basically, you know, do you feel like this is where people, you know, these people are more evil? And so he gives the answer, and it's a very simple answer, and it's in the first word in verse 3. No, <laughs> no, I tell you, but unless you repent, you're all likewise going to perish. Unless you, I, I tell you, unless you repent, uh, he, goes, those, he goes on to another story, those 18 of the t whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Everyone's like, oh, man, God must have had it in for them. And Jesus like, no, no, no. You don't understand? Unless you all repent, you're all going to perish. All of you, you're all likewise going to perish. Jesus wants us to make a connection between, wants us to make a connection between tragedy and suffering. I mean, not Jesus. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jesus wants us to make a, um, bleh. Back that up. Jesus wants us to make a connection between tragedy and suffering, not tragedy and sin. You see suffering and response in a hurricane, not judgment. And, and that's what Jesus is saying. Listen, when, you, when, that, when that tower fell and those 18 people died, that is not because of their sin. We need to see the suffering and we need to be called out of that. Our response should be the suffering of those people, not the sin of those people. As a believer, as a person, as, a, as, as someone who cares for other people, love God, love people, as we see tragedy, our first reaction should be for the suffering of those people not for the sinful nature of those people. You know, when we see, you know, a, a, a nightclub, a, a, a nightclub full of uh, people who are homosexuals and they get shot up, our, our first reaction put should be the suffering of those people, not for judging the sinful nature of those people. And Jesus is like, we have got to stop connecting tragedy with, sinful, with, with sin. We need to connect tragedy with suffering. I remember when uh, Katrina hit, it was amazing how many preachers, how many people in pulpits, preachers, were calling Katrina a judgment upon that sinful city, New Orleans. I mean, there are preachers actually saying that, that, that God sent a hurricane to destroy all those sinful people in New Orleans, forgetting the fact that there's an incredibly God, godly seminary right smack dab in the middle of New Orleans. Let's forget about there's incredible churches there. Let's forget about there's incredible ministries going on there. We need to connect tragedy with suffering, not tragedy with sin. <clears throat> when we see someone suffering, we see someone on the street, a hobo, a homeless person, someone who is in need, we need to be very careful not to connect that tragedy with their sinful nature, and we need to connect that tragedy with their suffering. Why? Because we're all in need of repentance. 
when we see people in catastrophe, instead of asking why them, if you look at the nature of man and the holiness of God, you should probably be asking why not all of us. We see what goes on in Haiti. We see what goes on in Honduras. We see what goes on all around the world. We see tragedy strike, and you look at them and say, why them? Why are they suffering? God, why are you, why are you picking on them? Well, if you really look at the, at the doctrine and theology of who, uh, how great and how holy God is and how horrible and how unholy we are as a people, the greater question is not why, not why them. The greater question is why not all of us? Why are we all, not all attacked? Why are we not all um, uh, crushed uh, by a holy God? And so we have to be careful as we, as we look at that, as we look at individual situations. We need to, we need to take a step back and look at a very holy God and, 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 and respond from his perspective and respond from a Christian perspective. So the reason any of us have hope is because we serve a very patient God who is, will, who is waiting for one thing, and he's waiting for Repentance. I think about that. That is so beautiful. Marty opened up uh, the, the sermon bumper with the idea of repentance and how it's beautiful. And repentance is beautiful. Uh, we think of repentance as like you do something wrong and you have to fix it. Like, you know, when my son, you know, he does something wrong, it's like, fix it. You know, pick it up, fix it. You know, well, that feels like there, there's nothing beautiful in discipline. But there's something really beautiful in repentance. There's something beautiful in a God that is patient, that sees you doing wrong over and over and over and over and over again instead of judging you, instead of him saying no more. Instead, he's patient because he believes in you. He's trusting. He's waiting for you to turn to him. 2 Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness. But he is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Why is God waiting? If we know the end game is that we're all getting called up to glory, why is, why is he waiting? Just get it over with. Let's go. I'm sick of this fallen earth. I'm sick of sin. I'm sick of everything just going to, you know, Hades in a, hell, in a handbasket. I, I said, try to, all right. All right. Um, so anyway, we, we, you know, instead of waiting on that, God, just, just get this over with. Let's just start this new heaven and new earth thing. Let's just go. But he does it because he's patient. He's waiting. He's, because he doesn't want anyone to perish. He's waiting. What is he waiting on? He's waiting on you. He's waiting on me. He's waiting on all of us to go out there and to share the gospel. He's waiting on people because there's people in your neighborhood. There's people in your family. There's people in your, in your jobs that, are, that if he were to say, now is the time, they would, end, they would have eternity in hell. He's patient. He's waiting on us. He's waiting on people to get the church to rise up and to point people to him and to draw more people to him because he doesn't want anyone to perish. I saw a beautiful definition of repentance. It is a heartfelt sorrow for sin, a renouncing of it, a sincere commitment to forsake sin and, uh, and walk in obedience to Christ. I love that. A heartfelt sorrow for sin. And I just, I love that spirit that it's not a heartfelt sorrow for wanting to go to the bad place. Instead, I want to go to the good place. No, no. It's a heartfelt sorrow for sin. Paul puts it this way in 2 Corinthians. As it is, I rejoice, not because you were grieved, but because you were grieved into repenting. For you felt a godly grief so that you suffered no loss through us. For godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. God, I love that godly grief produces repentance that leads to salvation. A godly grief, a, a spirit of God that overwhelms us to where we look at sin. We look at our sin and we see how it grieves God and that grieves us. Our heart breaks for sin. Our heart breaks. We cry out for the things that God cries out for. We are loathe the things that God loathes. 
We don't choose to embrace the things the world embraces. We choose to embrace, rather, the things that God embraces. So that is the question. That's the answer. So what's, uh, what's the reason? The reason is because God is patient. Verse 6 through 9, he tells this parable. A man had a fig tree in the vineyard, and he came seeking fruit and found none. He said to the vine dresser, you know what? Look, it's been three years. Cut it down. Why, why are we... Uh, why, why should we let it use up the ground? And the vine dresser said, Sir, let it alone one more year. Let me dig around it. And I'm going to put manure on it. And then it should bear fruit. So why? Why, why must we repent? Or why, 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 is this, why is this answer that way? The reason is because God is patient. God is patient. And the reason that God has not chosen to go ahead and judge you is because he is patient. And like I said, he's waiting on you. He is patient. He sees potential in you. There's something amazing. Uh, when, when, when we look in the mirror, I remember teaching youth one time. And we're talking about that you're, you know, uh, to, to love each other as he, you know, one. Uh, the, the golden rule to love each other as you love yourself. And I remember talking to a teenage boy after church one night. And he was tearing up and he said, Sean, he said, I hear what you're saying. He said, but I hate myself. And that makes me hate everybody else. He's like, I hate God for making me. I hate myself for who I am. And, and I hate everybody else for not seeing it. And he had so much anger. And he had so much hatred in his heart. And I just, my, I just began to weep. And I just began to, my heart broke for him. And I, was, I said, son, you don't understand. You're a great kid. And I just began to tell him how his gifts that I saw in him, leadership abilities that I saw in him, and how, uh, you know, just a, a divine spark of creativity that he had in his life. He was a skateboarder and he was an artist. And he, I was like, man, God has given you this, this incredible creative gift. And he just began to weep, and we began to cry one another. I said, I'm just telling you, I see something in you that you don't see, and I'm telling you, you've got to let the enemy, you know, uh, you, you've got to rebuke the enemy from lying to you and telling you that you're worthless. And that young man, he gave his life to Jesus, and, and you know, from time to time, he's, he lives out in Monk's Corner, has a family, and, and I think about that young man, and I think about, you know, how... No one in his whole life ever saw potential in him. No one in his whole life ever looked at him and said, you have value. And that's a great thing about our loving God. You see, the reason he's patient, the reason he hasn't gone ahead and judged you is because he believes in you. He sees potential in you. He sees something amazing in you. And he wants to, he want, he's, he's waiting so that that can come to fruition. He's waiting so that that can come out. Here's the thing, though. Notice that he doesn't just let it sit there and hope that the fruit comes. He said, all right, all right, all right. Um, let me just try one more. Let me just try, give it one more year, but I'm going to dig around it, and I'm going to cover it with manure. Now, not everything we read is supposed to, you're supposed to read into it. But I was, as I was writing this sermon the other day, I was like, <laughs> you got to read into that, all right? You got, you, okay, I'm telling you guys this right now. If you're looking at your life and you don't see your life bearing fruit, if you, you don't see your Christian life bearing fruit, I'm going to tell you two things right now. I'm not necessarily saying that's what this means, but I'm going to tell you what this means, all right? Two things right now that you got to do. You got to dig a trench around you and separate yourself from things that you shouldn't be involved with. You need to dig a trench around you and separate yourself from other, you know, other trees that are sapping your energy, other, other, uh, other people that are sapping you or influencing you. And so you need to dig a trench around you and separate yourself from those people that are, that are hurting you or dragging you away. But I'm also going to tell you, sometimes it means you got to go through some crap. <laughs> 
Sorry, there's kids in here. Uh, sorry. Yeah, but sometimes you got to go through some mess, you know, a little manure, you know. Sometimes you're like, God, why am I going through this? God's put a little manure, you know, just a little, little manure. And you're like, why do I have to go through this? Why am I? This is such a hard year. Why am I? Little manure, little manure, because we got to grow. And so I don't, we don't know why. And you're like, God. And so some of us are like, God, it's like enough manure. Okay, I got it. I'm growing. Okay, enough manure. And so, but God, it's amazing how God. God will use that. Sometimes we have to separate ourselves, and sometimes we have to be covered up with a little bit of manure. We have to be covered up with some garbage and with some crap, man, and we have to go through some stuff so that we can bear fruit. All of this is so that we can repent. We need to separate ourselves, and we need to grow. He says... Unless you all repent, you will likewise perish. We need to repent. The word literally is a military term. I mean, it literally means you're going this way, you turn around, you're going that way. It's to turn around. It's to change your heart. And so the, 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 the idea is we have to turn. So I'm going to give you two things real quick and we'll finish up. Why we should not repent and why we should repent. So as we're talking about repentance, as we're talking about this, so we need to look at why we should not do it and why we should. Number one, why we should not repent, this is selfish repentance. You should not repent simply because you got caught. This idea of repentance because I got caught. You know, your wife caught you looking at things on the computer you shouldn't or you got caught in the business uh, at your job stealing pencils or, you know, I don't know, um, uh, copy paper or whatever. You got caught doing something. And so out of that sense of worldly guilt, you have repented. That is not, that is not, should not be the basis for your repentance should not be out of a sense of guilt because you are caught. It should not be, cause, it should not be because you are uh, afraid. It should not be because you are afraid of either consequences, like, like specific consequences, like, you know, stealing copy paper or trying to save your marriage because you're busted doing something you shouldn't do. Maybe it should be, you know, maybe it's a broader fear that you're repenting because you're afraid of, you know, eternal damnation. You're afraid of an eternal hell. You're, that's what you're afraid of. And I'm telling you, that is not a healthy repentance where you are, are, are doing it out of a spirit of fear. You guys have heard me talk about this before. This is really big in the 80s where, where people would just scare you into heaven. And, and, you know, I wish preachers would talk about hell more. I mean, why? It's horrible. I mean, you know, I could talk about, you know, bad traffic. That's still bad too. You know what I mean? I mean, but I, the one thing, only thing you need to hear from me as a preacher is that, yes, hell is real. And, no, you don't want to go there. Okay, but I don't want to scare you into heaven. I don't want to say, do you want to go to hell? No one wants to go to hell. No one's like, oh, okay. I mean, I mean, so I don't want to scare you into heaven. I want you to, I don't want you to repent out of fear. I want you to repent out of what's next. And that's godly repentance. This is why you should repent. You should repent for number one, out of a desire to honor God. You love God so much that you can't imagine hurting him. You love God so much that you can't imagine not honoring him. Your repentance is due to a desire to honor God. I want to honor God with everything I have. And so if I, if I do sin, if I, if I get caught in sin, or if I, if I recognize sin in my life, sin of uh, uh, pride or sin of lust or sin of whatever, greed or whatever it is, if I recognize that sin, I want to immediately, I want to immediately repent from that, not out of getting, out of fear of getting caught, but I want to repent of that because I want to honor God. I don't want God to look at me and see that sin. I want God to look at me and see Jesus. I don't want God to look at me and see, uh, see uh, 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 greed. I want God to look at me and see the gospel. That's what I want. So we should, we should repent out of a desire to honor God. And number two, out of a hatred of sin. Now listen, when you're, if you're still dipping your toe into this Christian thing, you're still kind of figuring out this idea of holiness. But if you've been a Christian a while, 
We've got to develop a hatred of sin. I'm not talking about a, a repulsion of sin. I'm talking about a hatred of sin. You hate sin. We talked about that last week when King David uh, in Psalm 139 you know, he's talking, has this really sweet psalm, and he's talking about how he just wants these people who speak against God to die, and he's just all this hyperbole because David loved God so deeply he couldn't imagine people not. And so as Christians, we've got to develop this, this, this discipline of hatred of sin, of when we see sin and we are repulsed by it, we hate it. I see that, and I don't want any part of it. And it's a hard thing to get to that place. It's a hard thing to get to that place because of two things. Because of the power of sin. The power of sin is so strong. And it's like even though I know I'm looking at that and I know that's sinful, I know I shouldn't be anywhere near it. I know I shouldn't touch it. I know I shouldn't watch it. I know I shouldn't be interested in it. I know it should repulse me. But I still get pretty daggum close to it. The power of sin is so strong, and, and out of that, that should be one reason that we hate it. I don't use football analogies much because I just don't like preachers that are always touting their football team. But well, there's, there's, a, there's a college football team that they're just easy to hate unless you love them, and that's Alabama and Crimson Tide. Now, as a Georgia fan, I hate them, okay? And now, I don't really care. I say I hate them, but... You know, whatever. It, it, my team loses at 3 o'clock. I'm fine by 4. You know, it doesn't mess me up. Um, I, I, I'm not bought in that hard. But people, like, just ridiculously hate this team. Why? Because they win all the time. And Clemson's kind of getting to that place, too. It's like, you know, Dabo Sweeney's such a godly man. Oh, shut up. I mean, it's like, I don't want to hear it. I'm so sick of hearing Davo Sweeney. I'm so sick of hearing, uh, you know, about Alabama and Clemson. I can't stand them. Why? Because they're so powerful. And it's like, it's almost not fair. And it's like, sin is so powerful. We should hate it. We should hate the power that it has over us. We should hate the power that it has over our family. We should hate the power that it has over our culture. We should develop a hatred that should be so much stronger than any hatred you have for a football team. This should be so much stronger for any hatred you have of, of, of any human being alive. You should hate the whole idea of sin because of the power that it has in this world, the power that it has over your life, over your family, over this country, over this culture. We should develop a hatred of sin for the power of the sin and the destruction of sin. I mean, if you really want to look at it, if you really want, if you want to have an interesting conversation with an atheist, and an atheist will not acknowledge the idea of sin because they, you, you can't because uh, to have sin, you must acknowledge a moral compass. You have to acknowledge a godly moral compass. And so if you want to engage an atheist, just talk about the idea of sin. Talk about the idea of things that God tells us not to do. And look at if you do the things that God, if you sin, if you go against God's perfect plan, that always leads to destruction. It always leads to destruction. Whether it's, whether it's in the family, whether it's in the culture, God has given us a way to live. And that way leads to holiness. It leads to righteousness. Sin leads to destruction. And we should develop a godly repentance out of desire to honor God and desire to hate sin. And, and so when we think about this, as we go through this next couple of weeks, we're going to be unpacking this, this discipline of repentance. I, I want you to know, I want you to feel, I, I want this to be kind of the beginning, the idea, the heart of it, the, the foundation, that you know the idea of repentance is that, 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 that we want to honor God, that we want to, to, we want to put to death any sin because we hate sin, because God hates sin. We also need to know that God is waiting on you to repent, and that is such a beautiful thing that he is waiting on you, he, that, that he is that vine dresser. It's like, no, 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 no. Uh, Jesus is the vine dresser and can tell God, no, don't, don't take him yet. Don't, don't cut him down yet. A little longer. Give him some time. I, 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 we need to develop. We, we, we need to separate them. We need to maybe cover them with some crap. We also need to 
Eliminate this idea that some people's sins are worse than ours. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. There are some agendas that are very powerful. And so you may hear me or may other people hear other people talk about how damaging certain sins are because the agendas behind them are, are tearing apart our country. But I'm going to tell you, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And just because your sin may not be as icky as your sin, it doesn't mean that you're any better. It doesn't mean that you're any worse. We're all in need of repentance. We all need to repent. We all need to turn to God. We all need to surrender our life and, and to repent and to be holy. And so today I'm going to finish up and just ask us just to take a moment and to pray. This is all about you right now. Last week, as we were looking at the psalm, it said that we must seek and follow. And so I'm just going to ask us to pray, and I want you to ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart. And if there's anything that is not of God, I need you to turn away. I need you to repent. I need you to give it to God and turn away. I need you to hate that sin that is in your life. I need you to give it to God and I need you to walk away. Now, if you want, you can just do that at your seat and just, just cry out to God and say, I give it to you. We have, a, we have a cross station up here. It's our way of kind of metaphorically nailing your sins to the cross. This thing is like four years old worth of sins. Marty or not, nor I ever, ever take those off. We don't know what sins are on there. We don't look at them. But maybe you want to take just a moment, come up and, and write, write down what you, need to, what you need to repent of. And you write it down and put it up on the cross, nail it to the cross. Or you can just do that right at your seat. But just take these moments. Holy Spirit of God, move in this place oh God we love you we want to honor you so bad and yet we're always fighting with this power of sin in our life may we develop a hatred a true hatred of sin may we long to honor you God thank you for being patient with us God Thank you for being patient with us because, God, we are so, we are so stubborn doing us in our life what needs to be done so that we may turn to you. In Jesus' name, take a moment. Before we go, I just want to uh, encourage you guys, um, if you're not a member, please uh, let us know. You can sign up online or put it on the blue card and put it on the way out, uh, in the information on the way out. Uh, if you have, if you're watching online on Facebook or if you're here today, last couple of weeks, I've been throwing it out there. You know, we're not, we, don't, we don't necessarily do altar calls or things like that all the time. But if you have, if God, if the Holy Spirit has been leading you and you've been playing church and you're like, you know what, pastor, it's time. I need to surrender. I need to surrender. I need to give my life completely to him. 
Well, we, we follow that up with baptism. You say you make that decision, and the way you make that public to everybody, the way you tell everybody, the way you shout it from the rooftops is that we do baptism. And whether it's here at the beach, we throw you under the water. and you're, you're, you're saying your old life goes away, and you come out of that water, a new creation, and you declare to your brethren, you declare to the rest of your church, I am a believer. And if you have not followed up your decision to to surrender your life to Jesus with baptism, we're going to set up another day for baptism uh, on the fifteen uh, on the twenty second, August twenty second. And so, uh, if you would like to do that, if you're online and you hey, I, I need to be baptized. If that's you, you let me know, and we'll set that up. Guys, I love you so much, and I'm praying for you on the daily, and I just can't wait to see what God's going to continue to do in you and through you. Just know that God believes in you. Know that he is patient because he sees something in you. Surrender to that. Love you guys. Go and send no more. Have a great week.